as I was praying this week and seeking God's face in a, in a direction to go, I, I wasn't moving real fast. I wasn't getting in any direction. And the Lord really impressed upon me to just park it here, park it here on this subject that we began to talk about last week, and that subject is the truth. The truth. Such a big deal in the world that we live in today. And so, uh, as we have been, for the last several weeks, we, we have been emphasizing what may seem obvious, but in the busyness of life, we can lose sight of things. With all of the information over, overload and all that is coming at us today, we can, we can get overwhelmed. We, we, can, we cannot see the forest to save the trees, as the expression goes. And I, I, I'm just, on this day of the church growing, us remembering what Christ did for us. How many know that is what it's all about? We would, well, maybe some of you'd be here. I would not be here if that cross wasn't empty and if the tomb wasn't empty. That's why we are gathered here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. A byproduct of that is being able to do all that we can do as members and parts of a body, yes, to get blessed, to have community, to see one another. I hope that you encourage somebody today just by being here. But we established some things, and one of those things was that the world has a sin problem. The world has a sin problem, and as we said, thankfully, God has solved that, taken care of it when he put on flesh and went to the cross and rose from the grave. And then we talked for over a month about how the world has an identity problem, even some that are in the church, and we can actually call it an identity crisis. Thankfully, that can be solved as well because we absolutely can know who we are when we come to know who God is. And then last week, I introduced this third major problem or issue or crisis, whatever you want to call it, that the world has today, and that's a truth problem. And I asked the question, so what is the singular truth of not just the matter, but of all matters? Because we're currently living in an anti-Bible culture. It's an anti-biblical God culture. And so instead of a singular truth, what we have are, are, are many, several, multiple, biased, and personal truths. I mentioned we have many outspoken people who are willing to climb a hill, fight, and die on that hill. They are sincerely passionate about what they believe to be the truth. But the question is, what truth are you believing? What truth are you willing to die for? And this is why so many discussions and debates and arguments go round and round and round and never get anywhere is because everybody is standing on, basing their argument on their own personal truth. Instead of what I am proposing, the singular, absolute, definitive truth. Why? Why? We have to know, why? what's your reference point? If you're in a discussion with somebody and I pray... I pray that you are able to discern whether you are going to get into a productive discussion or if you're just going to chase each other's tails around the room. And I might suggest, don't waste your time. Go, go on, do something else. But when we understand who we are and what we're called to do, we are walking in the spirit instead of walking in the flesh. We are speaking God's truth instead of, instead of our own now we can perhaps get someplace. But you need to ask that other d individual or that group, what's, what's, your, what's your reference point? What are you basing your argument on? Is it just because you feel so strongly about something you can't contain it? I don't know if that's enough. Maybe it's just something that's, I just know this. H how, do you, how do you know this? Many things are based off of people's own subjective lived experiences is a common thing that goes on today. Well, you can't possibly know my truth because uh, you haven't lived the experiences that I've experienced. I'm taking a much higher view than that. Listen, we are born into sin, 
in a fallen world, and we all have that same truth. That's a fact. That's a biblical fact, and that's a lived experience that each and every one of us has had. They like to say, well, I read it somewhere. I read this or I read that. Where, where did you read this from? Uh, somebody told me this. Who told you this? We have to know from what base and foundation we are arguing or discussing, rather, our points. So whose truth are we going to live by today? So I, I get to these questions. Okay, so should we take turns? Today we're going to live by your truth. How about tomorrow we live by my truth? Should we, should we try that? And when you interact with multiple people, you understand where chaos and confusion come from. And unfortunately, in 2022, this is something, this is something that has affected the churches in America. This absolute truth is now coming, the, 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 actually something other than the singular absolute truth is now coming out of the pulpits in America. I come across two sources. One is the Barna Group. The other is the Cultural Research Center at the uh, Arizona Christian University. And both of these had the same, if not within one or two percentage points of these statistics. And these should absolutely stagger you if you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Only 37% of Christian pastors, 37% of Christian pastors, I, I, I got I to pay attention because I can't believe it myself. And only 13% percent of children and youth ministers acknowledge having a biblical worldview. 37% of Christian pastors, lead pastors like you're looking at, children's pastors, youth pastors, 13% observe, view the world's goings on through the lens of the Holy Scriptures. That's why Barna Group came out and said, Choose your church with the greatest of care as there's nearly a 9 in 10 chance that your kids will be taught lies instead of singular biblical truth. They went on to make a statement that America has lost her way because America has lost her pulpits. I ran across a quote by the great prince of preachers, Charles Spurgeon, 19th century preacher. He only lived to be about my age, unfortunately. But he said this, he said, do not go where it is all fine music, grand talk, and beautiful architecture. Go where the gospel is preached and go often. And it really struck me as I try to integrate the gospel in every message that is spoken. And you know why? Because it's in here. <laughs> it's in here. If, 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 if this is not being taught and preached in the pulpits, I don't, I, don't know what, I don't know what those people are doing there, on a, especially on a Sunday, one of their only free days that they have off. But we invest in this Sabbath day because we honor the Lord with it. And we come to hear the absolute singular truth of God's word. And so I'm going to ask everybody here this morning, what are you and your kids being taught? And I have the answer, in case some of you are wondering. The answer is whatever and or whomever you are listening to the most. That's what you're being taught. That's what you're digesting. We're talking about metaphors here, spiritually speaking. We need to be fed spiritually to sustain spiritual life. And so just as a reminder that I feel led to do again today, what or who, more likely, is the absolute singular truth? And I Gave a spoiler alert last week. I'm going to do it again this week in case anybody is questioning or wondering. But John 14, 6 hits it right on the head. When Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, the one who did all that we talk about and will continue to talk about, he said, I am the way. He might as well have said, I am the truth and I am the life. And no one, no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus Christ is the truth, and God's word is the truth. God's word is the truth. Truth by definition, it's conformity, conformity to fact or reality. So not something that we wish things to be, not some fantasy that we're hoping for, but it's to conformity to fact 
or reality. It's exact accordance with that which is, has been, or shall be. When we hear about truth written about in the Bible, it's not specifically talking about Christ himself. In that Greek language, the truth is taught in Christianity. It's respecting God and the execution of his purposes through Christ and respecting the duties of man. God's purposes through Christ and our duties as man. The truth is the truth which is the gospel or it's that which the gospel presents. So, so again today and this morning, We know who truth is. We know what truth is. We know where truth is. And so one main point I want to bring out this morning is we must be willing to speak the truth in this day that we live in and speak it boldly. Boldly. Uh, It's a theme. uh, We come up with a new theme every year. The ministry leadership team, the elders, and I present it to the church body. And our theme this year, let me remind you, is to be graciously bold. Graciously bold. Not not, not beating people over the head with this thing and stomping all over who they are. Graciously bold. Because words that carry great weight, like the truth, no matter what tone or volume they're spoken in, they are effective and powerful for moving hearts even hearts that might be hardened. And I have never experienced spiritual warfare in all of my Christian days as I've been experiencing in these last few years. Since a boy, I remember those songs. Onward, Christian soldiers. And it was just fun to do, and it's kind of a great little thing. But I'm telling you, the truth and the power of that song itself is amazing, and it's it's, it's, it's facing me in, in reality each and every day. I think of those passages, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're not fleshly, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Paul in Ephesians, the great sixth chapter, he says, put on the whole armor of God, head to toe. You may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, do we? But we wrestle against these things, spiritual warfare, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Listen, we best be bold because the world has no problem being bold. None whatsoever. What what, what have we been hearing for years and it just is literally... Actually, not, not even metaphorically, literally people screaming at the top of their lungs, be true to yourself and you be sure to be you. Live your truth. That's what you need to do. If it feels right, must be right. Do it. Do it. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine. Uh, he lives down in Louisiana. And he and his wife, I, I don't believe they had their children with them. They went to see a movie. Uh, PG-13 movie, and uh, the preview came on before the start of the movie for a movie, I'm not even going to give it, I'm not even going to tell you, the, I'm not even going to promote it, I'm just going to tell you what it, what it included. Promo for a movie that's coming out this September with the most vile, sadistic, perverted lifestyle promotion that I have ever seen, heard of, come out in a, in a, nor- in a normal theater. And there's, he looked around and he was just shocked as families, children, families had come to sit in this theater and this promotion of this filthy movie came on. I, I want us to think about what is flooding into the homes and the lives of our kids in America through cable and satellite and, and movies. And I will call out one, Disney, unbelievable. Un- unbelievable. The, through secular music, through smartphones. We got nine-year-olds running around with smartphones. I don't know why. I, I, the, the, I, I don't know. Maybe the parent has a good reason. But what is coming through that device? That's what your children are listening to. It's, what, it's who's teaching them. How about public education? All of these things, I'm going to just say this world is flat out bold as ever. They're indoctrinating. They are targeting. They are grooming the youngest of our people promoting these perverse lifestyles. 
that are as anti-biblical and anti-God as you can get. This is the work, the wiles of the devil. It is his absolute plan to seek, kill, and destroy. And he'll do it in whatever way that he possibly can. Well, I haven't seen the red suit, cape, uh, horns, and, and, and spear lately. You're not going to. You're not going to see it. But what you are going to see is this kind of influence that the world is so bold about. Let me just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to machine gun you these, these passages that the Bible speaks about the world. John talked about it in his first letter that he wrote. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, it is not of the Father, it's of the world. He goes on to say, we know that we're of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, he said, for the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. James tells us in the fourth chapter that adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You know, enmity, it's, it's hostility, it's hatred. Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. And in Romans, the well-known verse, chapter, chapter 12, verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world. We're talking about truth as its, as its definition. It's conformity to, 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 to reality and fact. And Paul reminds us, do not be conformed to this world. Do not let this world's truth become your truth. But be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what is good, what is acceptable in the perfect will of God. See, because God never intended us, he never certain, certainly didn't intend his church to get our clues from the world. We receive our instruction. We receive our direction from him and his word alone. Go with me to 1 Timothy. Paul writes to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Just going to read two, two verses here, 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. I need to get in 1 Timothy. And so Paul is writing to Timothy, and he said, These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly. But if I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is, hear this, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of, of truth. We talked about it, I think it was earlier this year, uh, that the church in the Greek is called the ecclesia. It's a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place. Exactly what we're doing here this morning. The church is a, it's a specific assembly or congregation of God's people who have been called out of darkness and into the light. Are you thankful for that this morning? Out of the darkness of this world and into the light of truth into the light of the Holy Spirit. The local church, we're an assembly of God's people gathered in the name of Jesus, and we are living, as Pastor Gary was praying, we live in unity. And in doing that, think about it, let alone two people getting together, we've got, we've got multiple people getting together, living in unity. Do you know what that is? That's testifying the truth of God's word to the lost and dying world. That's what it is. We are a together, are a testimony of God's truth. Now, this passage doesn't say that we're the source of truth. As, as some very large religion of the world claims that it does. It doesn't say we're the source of truth. It says that we're the pillar and the ground of truth. The source we know is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is... Jesus Christ. And so the church of the living God is the pillar and the ground of truth. Now, now these two words in the Greek, pillar and ground, they're only found in the New Testament in, in, this context, in this context of this passage. 
And you know what they mean in the Greek? They both mean the same thing. The pillar and the ground, they mean a prop or a support. A prop or a support. So they, they come from the Greek root words that imply something like they, they stiffen, they stabilize, they steady, or, or they hold. And so the church isn't the source or the originator of the truth. The church, that's you and me, by the way, we hold up, we prop up, we support the truth like a, like a column and a support supports the beam, right? We are the columns and the pillars as the church of God, living together in unity and harmony, suffering with one another, rejoicing with one another, encouraging one another, edifying one another, and us, by God, better be equipping you for the work of the ministry because that is the duty of man, allowed through the work of Jesus Christ. You and I have the responsibility of upholding truth in the world that we live in because if we don't do it, nobody will. And there is no truth more important than the gospel truth. Right? Even the secular world says, and that's the, when they want to emphatically make their point, and that's the gospel truth. I may have heard that expression. That's the gospel truth. They don't realize what they're saying. The gospel truth. The good news of the truth. Jesus Christ coming to earth, dying on a cross, defeating sin and death. That's the gospel truth. And more and more people don't know how good of news this is. They don't. I'm convinced. I think half the church doesn't realize how good of news the gospel really is. I, I, I think that, as again, I don't know if we, they never did believe it, they never did understand it, they, or they, they just don't know that there's a reason why Jesus Christ is such a significant figure in our lives. And so secondly, I, I want to make this point that we must be willing to speak the whole truth, and that means all of it. I know in the courts today, uh, they may not make you put your right hand on the Bible and, end, uh, and, 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 and acknowledge they no, they no longer end it in, uh, uh, so, uh, what is, so help you God. I realize that. But you know what they do? Do they at least have you affirm that you're going to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? And if the secular world is asking heathens and pagans to do that in the court, what do you think God is asking you and I to do as we are the pillar and ground of truth in the world? We need to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And the whole truth is this, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And all the world will be found guilty of breaking or transgressing his laws if, if, we were to stand before him alone. But the good news is that we don't stand before him alone. We stand clothed in the robe of righteousness that Jesus Christ made available when he went to that cross and he did what he did and he rose from the grave and he de defeated the power of sin. He defeated death that we were all facing before he did it. Because he is holy, righteous, and just, God abhors. He absolutely uh, detests and hates all sin, which really comes down to disobedience to his will and his will alone. Now, what do we hear from the American church? I've, I've heard it. I've heard it from other pastors. Uh, be, be careful so you're not speaking too harshly to the people. You might... You might Pastor, you might offend somebody. You need to speak some softer words that are full of grace and love. Just, just tell them how much God loves them as they are, that he's able to bless them beyond measure, and that he has a wonderful plan for their life, and you will pack out your building if you keep telling them that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Listen, i got to stand before God one day and be accountable for what I'm saying in this position behind this pulpit. And, and, and I, you can vote me out if you want, but I've got to tell you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. They say that no, nobody's going to come or stay or, 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 or listen to all that negative stuff. That holiness and wrath of God talk, that, that doesn't appeal to anybody. No, it certainly doesn't appeal to their flesh. 
But when that hardened heart is softened by the power of the Holy Spirit with holy conviction of their state, of, of where they're at when, when, when they understand, if they are not covered in the blood of Christ, of where they stand with God, they're, at, they're enemies of God who controls everything at every moment. He's the sovereign God. He knows every specific detail that has, is, and will happen in your life. He either causes it or allows it. He's the sovereign God. Always has been, always will be. This is who we're talking about. And so I would just ask them, okay, okay, uh, are you, uh, is it okay if I tell them, if, is, it, is it okay that I, I tell them that God is righteous? Is that okay? And they go, well, well, <clears throat> well certainly, certainly. You can tell them that, you can tell them that God, is, God is righteous. I said, thanks, that's all I needed. Because this same righteous God that loves and has mercy and forgives and blesses is the same righteous God that pours out his wrath on all sin. And that might be important to know if you're a sinner. Let me just state, there is nothing more important to know than that if you're a sinner. Because this brief life comes and goes as a blade of grass Eternity is for eternity. So imagine, imagine this in the natural. Not putting a barricade sign warning that the bridge is out ahead here on this interstate. Imagine that. Not putting a warning barricade letting the drivers know that the, that the bridge is out. What, how many drivers in here drive and they drive at least 65 miles an hour? It, well, you're, 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 you don't have to confess. I'm not asking for full confession here. Wouldn't you want to know if you were doing 65 miles an hour and the bridge is out just ahead? I, I, I would. I would. And we're talking about much more than a bridge out. We're talking about, hey, the bridge to, the, to the, this journey, of, this freeway of life that you're on, uh, the bridge is out, by the way. The bridge is out. And we're giving the bar a warning barricade sign. It's our duty. It's our duty as men and women of God to give this whole truth. Because if we really love people, we'd find a way Find a way to let them know. Let those that don't know Christ as Lord and Savior how this life can end. And so if the church is supposed to be the pillar and ground of truth, I don't, I don't think we need any more life coaches in the pulpits. I don't think we need any more success seminars. I don't think we need any more motivational speakers standing behind the pulpits of America. Because I just asked one question, how's that been going for us? How's it been going for us? Uh, how do you know if something is good news or not? It's, it's only going to be as good as, as you are aware of its alternative. It's only going to be as good as if you know, if you are aware of its alternative of, of well, what it, if I don't choose this good news, what are, what are my other options? Now, I have gagged on Spanish rice with tomato chunks since I was a, a little boy. And so if you put a plate of that in front of me, I won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But if you tell me that's all I'm going to be able to eat for the next year, guess what I'm eating? I'm eating Spanish rice with tomato chunks in it. I don't care. I will find a way. I want to live. I want to live. I want to see my kids and my grandkids in heaven. I want to spend eternity with this one, this one that went to the cross and shed his innocent blood and died that I might have life. I want to see him. I want to thank him face to face, man to man. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll eat Spanish rice with tomato chunks that's coming out of my ears if that's what it takes. So we have this expression, you've all heard it. So what do you want to hear? I, 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 got, I got news for you. I, I, got, I, got, I got bad news and good news. Which one do you want to hear first? Listen, always pick the bad news. Always pick the bad news first. You want to be able to end on a, on a positive high note. And listen, this Bible, this is, this is why I found, why, why I go with the bad news first and the good news, because God established it and set it up that way. And, I, and I'm, take this in context. I'm not saying that any part of these 66 books are bad. But listen, Three-fourths of this book, if you go by a word count, three-fourths of this book is kind of bad news. We're talking about the wrath of God. 
poured out on those that turn their back on him. Do not follow in his commandments. Do not honor him. Do not take down the Asherah poles. Do not take down the high places. Do not tear down the altars to Baal. It is not good news as to what happens to those people. And then just a fourth of it gives us the good news. I think it should be called the great news, but I'll go with good news. It should be the great news of God's love and his mercy and his grace and how he has given a man, that, that man that is, that is condemned to an eternal lake of fire in their sins and disobedience to God, to a life of fulfillment and pleasure and, and, and eternity. I always take the bad news first. And so as living in here in America, I say we stop this insanity. We all know what insanity is, right? We all know the definition of insanity. Stop the insanity. Let's stay with what had been working for mm, about a couple thousand years. Let's stay with that. Because it's the whole truth of what Jesus did for us. And so as we prepare our hearts and our spirits to remember what our Lord and Savior did for us, let's go to this passage in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I'm just going to read uh, the first... I'll read, starting in verse 1, I, I'll probably through verse 11 here. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, I love this, there's, in this passage there's two, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For when we were still without strength, when we were still sinners, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received rec this reconciliation. There's three fundamentals to our salvation. Three fundamentals to our salvation. They're found here in these verses 8 and 9 talking about his wrath and his grace. And we were reminded, last couple Sundays, I brought up this Ephesians chapter 2, uh, where it talks about how we once walked according to this world out there. We once did, according to the power, prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. It, it went on to say that we were by nature, it's intrinsic, we, it was inerrant in us. Children of wrath, just as the others. But here we just read in verses 8 and 9, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died from us. Why did Christ die for us? So that he could save us from wrath. The wrath of God against all sin, disobedience, rebellion. A anyone that would stifle the absolute singular truth. Romans 1 and 18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress or hold down the truth in unrighteousness. Chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 24, it defines, it talks about what, not, not righteousness as a character trait, but what his righteousness is able to do but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. That's in, that, in the whole entire uh, of the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. 
speaking of Jews or Gentiles, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Here's the good news. Being justified freely without any cost from you or I by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The, the, the law of God, it's righteous. And his wrath upon the sinner, it's just. You imagine having a judge who's not a just judge. And he has a, 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 a uh, con confessed and multiple witnessed murderer standing before him. And he just says, puts on his, his Academy Award act, uh, acting role and says, you know what, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I'll never do it, it'll never happen again. Um, I appreciate it. And the judge says, sounds good to me. Go on your way, live a free life. I think even in our fallen world, that judge would not remain at his desk because he's not a just judge. God is a just judge, and even his wrath is just. But that same righteousness that manifests as wrath also is able to produce mercy and grace. Gratefully, God's righteousness for you and I, it's a two-sided coin. It's a two-sided. I've got a lot of two-sided coin analogies. Has anyone ever seen a one-sided coin? <laughs> Just a random, random thought. I, 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 sometimes I can be like a squirrel. On the one side, his wrath is poured out on all sinners. As I said, even, even his anger is righteous and just as it condemns and punishes. But on the other side, same coin, it is a coin. On the other side is his grace poured out for all sinners. His love is righteous and just and having mercy and forgiveness. And so we're saved from God's wrath. Secondly, we're saved by God's grace. You know, John 3 and 36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. But as we read in these first two verses of Romans 5, therefore, having been justified, justified by the justifier, meaning just as if you've never sinned because of the atonement, the reconciliation work of the Lord, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this amazing righteous grace in which we stand and we rejoice in, in hope of the glory of God. It's by the grace of God that we're able to find that hope that comes by the way of the Holy Spirit and it's only found in Jesus Christ. And again, as I touched on in that Ephesians, that second chapter, the last couple of weeks, going on in that passage, verses 4 through 7. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we've been saved. And he raised us up together, and I love this, he made us. You know, there's sometimes God makes after our, our of our own free will that we have allowed the Holy Spirit to do a work and, and we, we, we choose to walk in repentance that John the Baptist spoke about when he first came, that Jesus spoke about when he first came. We walk in repentance that, that produces salvation through Christ. Amazing. After that, God will make you do some things, and I'm grateful for that. Sometimes I need a little shove. I need a little kick in the backside. I need, some, I need somebody to make me do some things. God will make us do some things. He made us. He's gonna, this is what he's going to make you to do one day, follower of Jesus. He's going to make you sit together in heavenly places in him. That in ages to come, he's going to show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward you in Christ Jesus. So we're saved from his wrath. We're saved by his grace. And we're saved through Christ's blood. Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. He, he, he took upon himself the full wrath of God. It's why the crucifixion scene uh, has never been accurately portrayed, but there's been some... Uh, 
the Passion of the Christ does a, a, a fairly good job of, of what we're talking about here, trying to depict what it would be like for the full wrath of God to come down on a human being. Jesus took it upon himself, the full wrath of God. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That's what propitiation is. By his blood, through faith, to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one, not just anyone, but the one who has faith in Jesus. Aren't you grateful today? God provided your ransom by his blood as a means of reconciling us back in relationship with him. Because of his love and sacrifice on the cross, you and I were able to escape the wrath of Almighty God and instead be made righteous, justified, by simply putting our faith, our trust in Jesus. Think of it. The only requirement that God asks of us is to believe, believe. And this is more than a mental uh, exercise. Believe, in the, in, the, in the Greek, in the original New Testament language, it means a joyful trust that Jesus is the author of salvation. Not only that, conjoined with obedience to him and his word. Because you remember why the people were under the wrath of God? Because they were disobedient to him and his word. And the news, as you look into it, not have time to get into it this morning, it only gets better and better and better as you walk with God, as the Holy Spirit of God abides in us because he empowers us to be obedient to God and his word. He doesn't leave us alone. We will never stand alone again. He is with us every step of the way. Amazing to know that his righteousness includes both his wrath and, thankfully, and I should get a big amen for this. Thankfully, his grace. His grace. And so we move to remember this gracious act that Jesus did today with one of the sacraments that we do here, that being communion. We remind ourselves of God's love and his mercy and his grace. We remember what Christ did when he made the greatest sacrifice that could possibly be made, giving up his own life for yours and for mine. We, we, we remember that he, he redeemed us. Once dead, spiritually dead in our sins and trespasses, and he, he reconciled our separation from God. And gratefully, he gave us victory. He gave us victory over sin and death, and he gives us an abundant life that starts now. Eternity has already began. Begins at conception. A person's eternity begins at, at, at conception. And so we are here acknowledging. What we're acknowledging is our dependence on God's grace and having faith, putting our trust in Christ and his finished work on the cross. Let's stand this morning. Worship team is going to lead us in a chorus and we're going to be partaking of communion but first things first we want to look within we want to examine ourselves so we come to this time with with great humility and a and a holy reverence for this almighty god that i've been talking about this morning Paul writes of this, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 32. And remember I said I'm committed to telling you the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so we just take this time, this, this reverent time. We're in the presence of God. The restaurant will wait. I don't think your roast will burn. If it does, I hope you got insurance. We're not in a hurry. This is a sacred time that the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people, are doing together. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, 
not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world, the world that does not know him. Let's just bow our heads. Everybody bow your heads with me, please. Father, we just reflect now, God. We examine our own hearts. Maybe there's someone here that doesn't know Christ as Lord and Savior. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all come short. Sin came to all by that one man, Adam, and by one righteous act, by one man. Jesus Christ, we're able to become righteous in God's eyes. We simply acknowledge our sin. We repent. We have a change of mind. We turn from those ways. And we put our faith and trust, we believe, a joyful trust that, that, the, that the only begotten Son was sent to the earth to die and sacrifice his life, receive the wrath of God in our place. And so now we simply receive the grace of God by his love and mercy and walk in newness of life, believing him for who he says he is. Lord, if there is disobedience in our lives, if there's rebellion in our lives, if, Lord, your word is taking care of ignorance for us this morning, we want to know you and know you more. Father, reveal yourself. God, forgive us of our, of our sins and our transgressions and our iniquities. Wash us white as snow with your shed blood, God, as we prepare our hearts, our minds, our souls to receive communion this morning. We thank you for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen.